I'm a professional sommelier and I'm gonna taste a 14, 40, and $400 bottle of German wine and see if I can tell the difference. A common question I get is, is the price of a wine related to the quality of the wine? And the answer, sometimes, but let's talk about it. And this video is sponsored by Wines of Germany. And frankly, I'd be making this video even if they weren't paying me. You see an expensive wine and you're gonna think it's gonna be a better tasting product. And this isn't always the case. And let me break down why. There's two really big factors on what makes wine expensive. The first one is production costs or how the wine is made. And I think it's very helpful to think about each step of the winemaking process and how you could either spend more or less money. For example, I was the wine director and sommelier for a Michelin star restaurant in Chicago, and that just means I'm better than you. <laughs> so let's just think about the grapes and the vine. High quality grapes are important for high quality wines. To make a high quality grape, you're usually having a lower yield. Less grapes means less product, but you get to put more care and love into the smaller amount of grapes. This leads to better fruit quality, but this could also mean more labor. If you think about picking grapes off the vine, you could do it by a machine, which of course is a lot cheaper, or you could hand pick the grapes, but that of course will be more labor costs and more expensive. And then even after the grapes are picked and they need to be fermented, you can choose what kind of vessel the wine should be fermented in. Stainless steel is gonna be cheaper than new American oak. The barrels are just simply more expensive. And then we can go into certain wine making techniques and aging potential. Wines that require more age need more space, more real estate, AKA more money. And then finally, having something that is certified sustainable or organic means just a higher cost as well. So considering the production costs, you'll also wanna consider something a bit more abstract, but very important, the marketing and the brand. We do not taste in a bubble. People usually know how much money they are spending on a bottle of wine. And there's been many studies that show that if you think a wine is expensive, it's going to taste better. Pricier wine, more expensive, more tasty, things like that. Even the setting and the environment will dictate how expensive a wine will taste. Think about going to a wine tasting on vacation and you just have on these great new white sheets that you didn't even have to clean. The wine is just gonna taste better. As opposed to picking a bottle of wine for a stressful work meeting, our environment's gonna have a huge factor of how a wine will taste. Even the packaging can influence how a wine will taste. Fancier labels, prettier bottles will ultimately decide if a wine's gonna taste more expensive or not. Even down to the story, a well-told story can contribute to a more positive tasting experience. And even finally, a simple supply and demand. If a winemaker makes less wine, they can charge more for it. But can you really taste these production costs and marketing branding? Let's find out. I have three Rieslings from Germany. So they're all from the same country and they're all the same grape. They are all Riesling. They've all been decanted for 30 minutes, but they're all at different price points. So I'll be tasting the $14 clean slate, which I bought at my grocery store. The $40 Schloss Johannesburg, which is vineyard specific, meaning that it's a higher quality. And then the $400, the highest quality Keller GG. I don't wanna to get too into the German hierarchy, but if you see GG on a bottle, it's fancy. And my editor guy, Mike, is gonna pour these for me. I am not cheating. <laughs> no watching. Thank you. I've got three wines in front of me. I have no idea what they are, but I can tell just by looking at these that one of them is different. This one, wine number three, has a tiny amount of bubbles on the bottom. Bubbles usually tell me something about how the wine has been closed, usually with a stelvin top or they twist off. You usually see these with New Zealand wines or Austrian wines. Wines that classically are closed with these screw tops will have sort of this effervescence or this bubble on there. So. Even just by looking at it, I'm making some guesses about what these wines are and what order they're in, but don't really know until I taste it. But I always try to look at a wine before I taste it. And if you thought that was a cool trick, why don't you watch this video and you can learn a bit more. Let's start with wine number one. This wine is intense. I am smelling a lot of stuff. Even if you can't quite put your finger on what you are smelling, it is very aromatic. The wine is really leaping out of the glass. I am smelling a lot of different kinds of things. Pretty flowers like honeysuckle, something almost savory. This is gonna sound crazy, but kind of like peanut butter. But this wine is very pretty. There's a lot of salinity, almost like if I'm standing on a beach and I'm hitting the waves against my face, it smells like that. 
Maybe just like the slightest bit of almond or something nutty in there as well. I'm probably smelling like eight to 10 different things, whether I can put my finger on it or not. Usually when I get a wine that's highly aromatic and I feel like there's some complexity or I'm smelling a lot of stuff, that usually indicates a higher quality wine to me. In general, more flavors means more quality. I don't wanna dive in too deep because I wanna check out two and three as well. With quality assessment, you're gonna wanna smell each wine and kind of pick something up so you have something to compare it with. It's a little easier that way. Ooh. Now this wine is very different. I'm calling this wine brighter. I'm getting more citrus fruits. Yes, there's aromatics and yes, it does leap out of the glass, but it's less of these like intense savory notes. And it's really more of like grapefruit zest, lemon zest, a bit of like honey or even like honeycomb. Ooh. Nice acid on there, really makes my mouth water. Kind of makes me want to go back to wine one because I didn't taste it, I only smelled it. Wow. Nice. So this one has a nice viscosity. It really coats your mouth nicely. As opposed to this one, which really just tastes more acidic. Like I can feel in the back of my throat, it makes my mouth water and that's great, but I can tell that this has some structure, some body. It really just coats your mouth nicely. All right, and then let's try wine number three. Now with this wine, I'm not smelling a whole lot. It does not jump out like wine one or wine two. I really feel like I have to stick my nose in there to smell something. It's still pretty. I'm still enjoying this wine. It's just a little harder to pick up certain notes on them. Oh, and that's lovely as well. This, I'm on a boat. I'm on a boat. Mm. It's zippy, it's fun. It's not as complex as these other two, but that's okay. This one's just really easy drinking and fun. And yeah, maybe there's not as many flavors going on, but it's still incredibly enjoyable, very food friendly. That acid, that tells me that these are all super food friendly wines. I love Rieslings in general because they do have the capacity to be a little sweet or what we call off dry, or they can be totally dry like these two. I find that Americans have a weird aversion to sweet wines, which doesn't make any sense to me because we drink soda, we drink iced tea. And when it comes to wine, it can be delicious in any category. So don't on sweet wines. They're delicious. So we've considered a lot of different factors and I'm gonna trust my gut on this one and say that number three is probably the $14 clean slate. And then it's between these two. Both have a nice complexity, but I'm gonna say as a professional who tastes a lot of wine, the thing that really stands out to me is the texture of a wine. I talk a lot about flavors because I think that's something that beginner to intermediate wine drinkers can understand. As you get more into wine, you find that texture is a huge factor of what you enjoy about it. Don't worry too much if that's too abstract of an idea, but I think from a quality standpoint, this is the highest quality one. So I'm calling wine number one, the Keller, and wine number two, the Schloss Johannesburg. Let's see if I keep my job. I truly don't know what these wines are and I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so we'll see if I get these right. Okay, okay. Suck on that. <laughs> okay, I can stop sweating. This is good. Uh, there's a reason why I'm a German wine ambassador. So really right away, as a professional, I could tell the $14 one. But again, I really like it. It just depends on what kind of mood you're in. So does price really equal quality? Well, sometimes. Even though I did get this correct, it's a lot of personal preference. It's a lot of deciding of what you like and your expertise of tasting to decide if it's really worth the price or not. Taste is so subjective and it varies from person to person. And even for professionals, they have a personal preference to some wines. Robert Parker, for example, likes these big bodied, big oaked wines. And that's just not everyone's cup of tea. And some of these more expensive aged wines have the higher price tag, but they have a very distinct taste that really just isn't for everyone. So even though, yes, I like how this texture and how this wine feels, I would probably drink this one every day. This is the one I'd have in my fridge probably all the time. And then either this one or this one is something I would bust out when it's a special occasion or a friend is over. I think it's good to know the differences and why a wine is expensive, but I think it's more important to know which occasion you should be drinking these for. Going on a boat, patio pounder, 
this one. Winemaker friends, you gotta impress the in-laws. I'd probably pick these two. And how do you get better at tasting these wines? How do you get better at deciding what you do or don't like in a wine or deciding if it tastes expensive or not? Much like going to the gym, I really encourage that people critically think and taste wines almost every day. Professionals and enthusiasts are more likely to get more out of a wine if they know what they're smelling and know what they're tasting. And if you want to do that, I do offer a four hour on-demand wine course that you can check out down below. You are, sir. The three wines you ordered. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, hello everyone. My name is Bean. I know nothing about wine. Cheers. That's good. That's that's better. Whoa, that one's really good. All right, so, which, which one do you think is the cheapest? I think that one's the cheap one. That one's the mid one, and then that's the expensive one. Are you sure? No, but let's bring it on. <laughs> Final answer? Final answer. I love it. Let's see. Those are all very good though. Do you have a favorite? Honestly, probably that one. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? No. <laughs> I'm never sure on things. Mmm. <laughs> all right, there we go. I got the there same we go. order. Bean. There we go. You're, you're a full-blown sommelier. I'm a sommelier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This, this is what makes you a sommelier. You just, yeah, you just drink wine. <laughs> 